Good evening, everybody. Happy Namaste. All right, so just setting up and then we'll start with a short breath. Hope all of you are doing well. Yes, all good. Oh, we look like we're in a similar color. Okay, so we're matching with the background of uh, Buddha Padma Sambhava today, <laughs> the colors. Shall we close our eyes, connect down to the palate, inhale and exhale, relax the body. Let's prepare ourselves today. Being aware of what we are here to do, to have a deeper and clearer understanding of these priceless teachings. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chur, Coxley Lord, Maha Guruji Nehru, to Buddha Kwanian, Buddha Sakyamuni, all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, to Lord Christ, to all the great teachers, masters of theosophy, the great angels and beings of communication, our respected internets and Wi-Fis, to our soul and divine selves, we humbly ask for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance, all through the session. We humbly offer ourselves as instruments to do your work. In the process, we ask you to help us to assimilate all the knowledge today to have a deeper, clearer understanding of these priceless teachings. We thank you for accepting us to do your work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. With gratitude, respect, and love, we thank you. Atma Namaste. So, you're supposed to go right today? No. No? Yeah. All right. I spoke last. You spoke last. You're supposed to give a summary. Eh? We're we not even it. finished. Yeah, but you said you'll start off with this before. We no, we'll end with the summary. Because there's so much back and forth. Now I forgot what I wanted to say last time. Okay, now he's forgotten what he wanted to say. Okay. All right. There's a few questions also. All right, uh, since we still have people joining us, uh, do you have your questions from last time which we did not answer? I think Deepa, I remember your name if you're here and uh, any of the others, if you could give your questions, we can start with that and then move to the rest. Sorry. I haven't muted anybody so you can just talk straight away. Uh, Amit. Yes, Bala Chandra, go ahead. Yeah, Amit, uh, last time we were discussing about something like uh, uh, in the sleep we are going out, out of the body and again there are some cords which are getting back and connected to, uh, get, getting back the uh, soul to back to body. Can you just give me some more information like uh, how actually, which are all the things that will be connected? And you're talking about connected. death or you're talking about... Um... Please, please, please. No, are you talking about death or when you're sleeping? Sleeping, sleeping. When you're sleeping, you have to be anchored to the body. So according to Master Chua, what I understood from him is the, there's a cord from your solar plexus that's still uh, to your astral body. Because if you remember, the solar plexus is part of your emotional body. It's, uh, um, part of it is interpenetrating. So that cord anchors you to your physical body. Because the solar plexus... Is lo lower chakras only will... Uh... No, no, no. It's just to anchor you so that you don't get lost. So that when, no, you, no, when no. you wake up, you, you come back. So the, you know, someone asked, they said, will I come back to the right body? How do I know I'm coming to the right address? So uh, that is that link which connects the dense body to the etheric. Yes. And so it's easier for you to come back uh, through that cord back into your body. Okay. Um, and then still people joining. Any Hello. Yes. Yeah. Um, Sumiji, I have a uh, doubt. Uh, say if we have seen a dream, I mean, how we'll consider whether it is a dream or it is an inner experience while we are sleeping. Say I have a dream that I had been to an ashram. I saw the, you know, uh, master's uh, statue there. Yes. Now, I don't know whether it was a dream or it was an inner experience. 
All right. Uh, this is my understanding. I could be completely wrong, but uh, there are times that in your uh, sleep state, what you experience is one, uh, your actual inner, inner experience uh, based on how the body can actually uh, interpret, interpret the same. So what happens is sometimes it's visual or it's symbolic. So whatever you've seen, if you can't remember it, then the brain interprets, interprets it as a symbol or an image. Yes. And so it could be the statue of Masutra. It could be someone you know. It could be a place that you've never been to. It's just something uh, that the brain uses to try and remember or recollect uh, partially in, in, in its own coding way uh, the uh, experience that it had. Now, for some of us whose brain has been upgraded to a greater degree and can register, then you actually register what you experience properly and clearly, right? So it could be that you actually attended a course there, or like you said, you actually gone to an ashram of Master Chua and you've seen the statue. So these do occur. Uh, so in psychology, what we talk about dreams is usually an interpretation of what your subconscious is trying to address to you in the conscious state. However, in, in spirituality, it's not necessarily always uh, something to do with something that's wrong with you. It could actually be an experience that you've had during your inner, uh, in, your, in your travels into the inner world. Yeah? You want to add anything to that? Um, there, are, you know, there are ashrams in the inner world. There are temples. There are mosques. Um, I remember once, um, was it there? Even when your body is dead, apparently, you can also study. I remember, was it in the, I don't know whether Master Cho was talking about this, or I think it was Master Cho. So he was guiding a group of, um, not he, but one of the teachers, I won't give names, was guiding a group of disciples in the inner world. And there was a group of, um, um, not Sufis, but... What do call them? maybe imams, uh, they were sitting in a group and they were sitting and reading the Quran. And so uh, the teacher, the disciple, one of the disciples asked the teacher, teacher, what are they doing? Uh, the teacher's like, ah, they're studying the Quran. So, and there were other uh, beings there. So, and, um, but did, did they study this their whole life? He's like, ah, yes, but now they're understanding what they're studying. <laughs> Something like that. I, I, I'm, I don't know where it is proper information. I just don't know where it came from. I think it's Master Choa who told us this. Um, now, when you're sleeping, there are three factors, okay? So we will talk about these, uh, one of the factors, because you see, when your body, uh, you have certain thoughts and emotions. For those of you who read the Achieving Oneness with the Higher Soul book, you have certain thoughts and emotions in your aura and your chakras, Okay. Um, which is called inner noises, right? So there are various influence. So for example, you have thoughts. So right now you're thinking about what I'm talking about. Uh, before this, maybe you were thinking about tea. Before that you were, I don't know, studying something, watching TV, producing more thoughts. And so in a day you have a lot of thoughts. Now multiply that number of thoughts by the number of uh, days and the number of uh, days you've been alive. So that's a lot of thoughts. So what happens is it creates this shell around you. And uh, unfortunately, since they are thoughts and usually thoughts are accompanied by emotions, this shell is predominantly present in your emotional and mental bodies. Okay. So look, this is a complicated question. So you get a <laughs> sort of answer. And this shell, unfortunately, when your body sleeps also, and of course, when your body dies, We'll talk about the death part. The shell, uh, since it's thoughts and emotions, when your soul transfers to the vehicle, the emotional body or the mental body, it also, uh, that shell travels with you. Actually, you travel to the shell, okay? So when you're using, you have to use your emotional, our astral body to travel in the astral world. You cannot because you have all this shell of um, thought forms. So it's like driving with a very dirty windshield. You can't see anything. So in that case, you're only meditating on your thoughts. So sometimes you notice when you're stressed or if you're studying for an exam or you are thinking of something, you're sleeping and you're dreaming of the same thing over and over again. You're not in the inner world, you're just in your shell, okay? That can happen sometimes when I binge watch uh, certain Netflix shows. Uh, you know, you sleep and then you start to see 
<laughs> if you're watching Korean stuff, you'll start to see Korean stuff, or you start to see action, you start to see cartoons, or if you're playing a video game, this happens also. If you're playing a video game, not even when you're sleeping, you close your eyes, you'll see the image. So these thought forms are, are there. So you need to get rid of them. So that could be one. So you're just thinking about maybe you're reading certain book on, on spirituality, on this, on that, and those thought forms have accompanied you in the astral world, and that's what you saw in your dream. Number two, it could be uh, an actual place, an actual place. Uh, there are temples, there are all sorts of things in the inner world. There are huge civilizations, I heard, okay? Uh, whether your brain can interpret what you see and what you experience, that is another matter. The third thing I just forgot. All right, so one of the things one. that Masacho mentions is that's why when he says when you go to sleep, you don't actually watch TV and go to sleep. Uh, he prefers that you and I do maybe a lot of prayer meditation, for example, or anything to cleanse and purify your aura of this inner noise so that when you sleep, it's easier to move from this state and, and, trans in, and transfer yourself into the astral body and move into the inner world. Uh, and also one of the things that he says is to read something that is much better than what you and I would do reading a novel or things like that. So uh, maybe a, a spiritual book, something like that, so that the thoughts that you create before you go to sleep Yes, would be of a higher frequency, of a higher nature. And therefore, automatically, obviously, when you go into the astral world, the energy that you portray, yes, emotionally, the same vibration or the same frequency you will attract in the inner world. Now, the inner world is usually only the astral. Um, it's, it's usually, I think it's the astral world. Right? Astral you can go higher, mental, uh, higher astral. And lower mental. So those are the areas that you normally go. So depending on what you are coming out with, right? I'm talking about in the night when you come out with all those thoughts, depending on what thoughts and emotions you have when you leave this physical body, that's the same vibration you enter there, whether it's, like he says, uh, a frequency with, with gaming, uh, a frequency with the television or the movie that you just watched or what you read or even the meditation. So that wouldn't be too bad if I would go to, uh, you know, the gaming place, uh, it's not too bad. You can go to Las Vegas also if you want. Or you can go to the inner ashrams, whatever you want. That's one of the benefits. So don't don't be excessive about it and ban TV for everyone at home uh, after hearing this. It's okay. It's just an expression. By the way, the third one, uh, there are several, but the, these are three important ones. The third one could be, um, you know, sometimes you have a dream or sometimes you have an experience. And it feels like a deja vu, like, you're sitting there, you're eating and everyone's joking. And they're like, have I done this before? I think I have done this before. No, I couldn't have done this before. I, it feels like it's like a premonition that had come to you long ago, which you forgot about. But while you're doing it, just for a split second, something happened. All right. Um, or sometimes you actually do have a dream. You remember the dream. And a few days later, something happened. All right. Uh, that could be because in the inner world, you see, there are beings. Remember, I told you in charge of materialization and... Um, so you have seen an event because even events, anything, you know, it's law, right? So anything, not only in your physical body, but even events and calamities, whatever, these happen in the energy world first before it materializes physically. So it comes down, 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 then into the physical. So on its way down, you have observed this and you've dreamt about it. It could be in your life. It could be outside and uh, maybe it materialized. So it could be also a sort of what they call premonition, but actually it's just very simple. Uh, it's explanation principle of correspondence. So it's not something so special. But sounds cool if you don't know anything about principle of correspondence. All right, I think you were answering this last time with reference to murder suicide that the energy already changes. In case of murder suicide, that's they die. mostly planned. So then in that case, the seeds are withdrawing. Not suicide, like I said, remember I talk about the higher will and the lower will the lower will and the higher will. You are the higher soul, you have will. But the incarnated soul is you, is you, but that will is contaminated by many other factors. So sometimes since the will is not aligned, all right, that's why let thy will be done. We spoke about this already. Um, then you're influenced by many things. So you are free to change. You might just disagree with yourself <laughs> for the moment. Because you don't know who you are in the first place at that time. You regularly see plane crashes. Ah. I have no idea. Um, regularly seeing plane crash. 
in psychology it's called a recurring dream and you need to you need to figure out why and what does it mean to you yeah there are several factors so. i mean that's this psychology but with spirituality master has never given us any clue to this no, uh, but it's a good thing to write it down like i said sometimes uh things that recur regularly it's basically a message from your subconscious yeah? uh and in uh, meditation if again if you see similar things over and over again master joseph says write it down the answers might come to you at a different point uh maybe you attend a session maybe you read a book it might come to you later which it did for example for me um can we do lord's prayer in the lying down position uh no you will be sleeping with the lord then not the death way but maybe in the inner world immediately and plus you know the meridians are compressed so the energy cannot flow properly there's a lot of movement of energy in the lord's prayer so the first half the first half of the lord's prayer for those who do a uh, new arhatic it's like the christian version of the kundalini yoga one of the versions so you the first thing is from here 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 you bring the energy down and then the next part you are bringing the energy up so you bring it down then you bring it up you bring it down you bring it up okay so if you are sleeping you are lying down you probably your body will sleep because already the lord's prayer activates the upper chakras much more than the lower so if you are lying down subconsciously your body is automatically you are used to sleeping in that lying down position so most likely your body will go to sleep your basic will become even smaller and you will sleep okay. so last question and then we go ahead uh okay um, sumi so no. amit I, yeah oh, um, back yeah. okay yeah so i wanted to this was a question from last time that when we were talking about uh, suicide and murder about whether a termination of pregnancy by choice in the first few months because the soul would have the higher soul would have already picked the parents and would have decided that was going to be coming and incarnating as that baby and not allowing that incarnation to happen by terminating the pregnancy is that considered murder because we were talking about karmic repercussions of murder yeah yeah but this is a slightly uh, sensitive question <laughs> which is being yeah i mean i'm not asking from a political direct standpoint from just an energy standpoint from a, from an energetic standpoint we won't say whether it's okay or not but from an energetic standpoint from what i know uh is that um you see once again the lower will comes into effect all right the lower will comes into effect because you're deciding the incarnated soul uh the mother uh, is deciding to you know you know uh, abort the fetus for whatever reason um but the soul does not come until the 7th month of pregnancy so until then it's just flesh right so it's like you know not a big deal <laughs> right it's not uh, not not destroyed the purpose of the soul because the soul itself has not come the body is not yet the temple of the holy spirit right so uh if you're doing it and you can only abort as far as i know in the first 3 months so in the first 3 months they just it's just uh it's just flesh and uh, the seeds are there and if you abort it the seeds get withdrawn uh for whatever reason um that happened so um my understanding is that at that point it's just like uh, the clothes that we wear it, it's like we've just given it to the tailor and the tailor's kind of working on on the uh on the dress and then we decide listen i don't want it that's it so um it's basically just the bodies that have been created at this point so as as far as i'm concerned the way i see it it's it at that point um it is it is not really a soul that is being pulled out of their physical body when it comes to physical murder right so that's the way i see it yeah so we're not promoting abortion here let's <laughs> just to be clear we're just trying to make you understand this is the way we see it and and uh, i think this is the way i i also heard it from others so let's move on we're going to just mute everybody right uh, now when you have a sense that you know you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that those prompts are usually intuitive coming from the ground so uh, most of us try to follow that and uh, if you don't later on you realize oh my god i should have just listened to that voice yes the inner voice that is basically what you would call i am the way the truth and the life right so it sometimes guides you it tells you what is the right thing to do the truth and so that would be your guiding factor coming from your higher soul so let's move on and uh we're going now to the next paragraph where we left off um day before 
So it says the day passed, the days passed, the high principle gradually disengage themselves from the double and later then becomes in turn an etheric corpse, right? So the, basically you're trying to say that the physical body is dead, that has been disconnected. So you just have this etheric um, corpse as they call it, or, or like, a, uh, like a wreath that hovers. Now it normally hovers over the, where the dead body is, right? So whether it's placed in the morgue, whether it's placed in the house, whether it's placed in the cemetery or the church uh, graveyard, wherever it is, it just hovers over it. And they say that people have seen it uh, clairvoyantly in churchyards, sometimes looking like a violet or bluish white mist or light. Uh, that's what we referred to earlier. But uh, as the body starts decomposing, even the etheric um, double or the etheric body starts to look a little weird. And so maybe that's why ghosts have that, you know, like a long <laughs> eye kind of thing and, and it looks like it's drooping. And so it's basically got to do with, with the body sagging and, and kind of disintegrating and decomposing. <clears throat> so it continues to say that one of the advantages, right? Uh, so in, in many of the traditions, it's always been burial, right? So you just bury the physical body um, and uh, cremation is another option that they're talking about. And so we're going to go into cremation. So they say when you do cremate the body, which means that there is no part of this physical form left, right? Except for the ash and, and some bones. Then what happens is to those souls who are so attached to the physical form or to physical life or to materialistic life, they have nothing to cling on to. So it's actually easier and better for you to move from this level to the next level in your journey as a soul, rather than getting stuck with your physical form. And so they say the advantage of the cremation is that the dense body, yes, uh, is, is completely destroyed and so allows the etheric body to then disengage from it faster. Remember we said that it sometimes takes, I think it was mentioned, it, it takes a couple of hours to a couple of days, sometimes a couple of weeks. Now if, you, if the cremation happens, it can disengage really, really quickly. <clears throat> so it says that if... Um, if a man is uh, misguided and he wants to cling on to his physical life. So the concept of in the Egyptian tradition, the mummification and in the Christian, in, in the Hindu tradition, in the Islamic tradition where we bury, then there is a, a chance that these souls who try to leave will then try to attach themselves onto the physical body or at least the etheric uh, double that's there. And so they say, uh, the cremation basically entirely removes this, uh, this, this chance of the soul to cling on to the dense body or to the ethical body, right? However, they do mention that um, there are black magicians who do use both the dead corpse and also uh, they use the uh, ethnic body of a dead person for various other, for various other means which is not something we want to talk about. So we just leave that aside. And they, therefore they say, uh, so to avoid these people from misusing the body of the person that you love, it's better to cremate. And so I remember Master Hermie was sharing with us, she says, you know, in the Christian tradition, uh, there was no cremation. There, it was always suggested that you bury, but because of the pandemic and the number of deaths, uh, for example, she was talking in the Philippines, the, the church actually decided cremation is better. And if it is COVID-19, you definitely have to cremate. It's better to cremate than to, uh, to bury. And uh, so in many parts, and I remember I went to Goa, um, and there again, because of lack of space, it's starting to change. So cremating the body is, is far better than burying or mummify, mummifying uh, the bodies of persons that we love. So it says... When you do this, it is quite impossible for a dead person, right? Uh, since the, the soul is no longer connected to the physical body. So when you burn the body, they, they can't feel it. The soul can't feel the burning sensation. So if you're worried about that, they say don't worry. Uh, what's good is that the astral and the etheric matter uh, can separate easily then from the dense body. Yeah. Do you want to continue or shall I move on? Uh, let me see. Okay, let me just do the next Yeah, part. yeah, just finish that. Yeah, so, um, so this is the part where they talk about a dead person, uh, sorry, a dead person who's trying to get back into his body. 
And in case, for example, even if the body has been cremated, right, they then try to stick on and they try to pull themselves into the etheric double and they try to linger in the etheric double because for them going towards the light or going towards the, uh, the next part of their journey is too scary and they prefer to stay in the physical form. Even and if the body's so, been cremated, it's written here? No, it's not. No, no. So one of the things that I remember Master Chow would say, because there are these people who are so attached to their, say, their homes or, or their money and their property, they linger around in that space and um, they stay for so long, sometimes it can be 100, 200 years. So when you go and buy, say, an ancient uh, house uh, that's been there for 400 years, sometimes maybe it might just have a ghost who's so attached to that place that's, that it's still ho hovering around or sticking around uh, in that place. Yeah. Is that the etheric or astral? I think that's astral. There is also the etheric. Yeah, but first sorry, no, no, no. Years. Sorry, for hundred years it's not uh, etheric; it's the astral. So you do have these uh, beings that do reside, and uh, we'll come to that in a bit. But let me just finish off this part of the where was I? The cling. Yeah. So in case uh, those who are dead want to still cling on to their physical form, uh, the astral body cannot altogether separate from the etheric. So um, it's a little sad actually, but we'll come to that also in a bit. So what happens is they, they're supposed to move into the astral body, but because they're clinging onto the etheric double of, of the etheric body, they do find it difficult. And then they say, they awaken still surrounded by the etheric matter. The condition is very unpleasant because the person, because of this etheric matter, is shut down, shut out of the astral plane or the astral life. And so they cannot go into the astral life. They cannot go back into the physical life. So they're basically stuck in between. And, and when they're stuck right in between, it's very difficult because they're just going to be drifting around till that etheric body, which in due time will disintegrate. It cannot last forever. So till that disintegrates, they're going to keep staying here. And then, then slowly they go into the astral. But uh, it's not a place where they can experience much, right? They can't feel the physical form. So it says here uh, that... At the same time, they lose, yes, the physical sense organs, preventing him from becoming fully in touch with the earth life. At the same time, also the astral world, there is a shell created because of this etheric body and they cannot even live in the astral world. So they basically stuck, they, bust, they, they, they drift along for a very, very long time. And they say it's like a thick, a gloomy fog that they kind of walk, move around, hover around. Uh, and they're lost between the physical plane and the astral plane. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is a little bit, um, it's going round and round, merry-go-round, so I'm just going to uh, explain it uh, how I understand, because, you know, it's shuffling between astral and etheric, and it's confusing me. So let me just explain to you what happens, all right, as far as I know. You have the incarnated soul, right? The incarnated soul is always remember the higher principle encompasses the lower principle. So first hint, it says, as the days pass, the higher principles gradually disengage themselves. What are the higher principles that they're talking about? Right? So when your body's alive, what happens is on the seventh month of pregnancy, if you read the book, Achieving Oneness with the Higher Soul, the um, there is a chakra called the twelfth chakra. Most people, it's not even a chakra; it's a point of light. So, twelfth uh, point <laughs> or the first point. Uh, so the soul anchors itself, and it radiates downwards and outwards. And it basically, since the higher principle encompasses the lower principle, it interpenetrates the mental body, the emotional body, the etheric body, and the uh, physical body. So, uh, and how does it interpenetrate? Uh, based on my understanding, I could be wrong. Uh, when you look at it, it's like, um, when you look at solid, it's solid, but in, in uh, you know, even in the physical matter, you have solid liquid gas. The difference between solid and liquid and gas is that the, there is more space between the molecules, if you remember correctly. So, um, so although something looks solid, even though it's solid, if you remember in, um, in science, it's basically solid is there's less space between the molecules, but there's still space. So this uh, incarnate soul energy, so 
all each high, higher principle encompasses the lower principle. So you have an emotional body, uh, you have an etheric body, right? First, uh, the etheric body is more subtle than the physical body. So this energy goes through these spaces and interpenetrates the whole body. Okay, that's how it interpenetrates. Now, when you look at emotion, uh, emotional body, the emotional body is outside the body, it extends outward, but it's even more subtle than the etheric body and the physical body. And etheric body might look solid, but or etheric the matter, but there are still spaces. And since the emotional uh, energy is more uh, subtle, it goes through that and goes through uh, the, the physical body, it goes through the etheric body and into the physical body, interpenetrating everything. You see, I'm freezing, maybe I should exit full screen and see if that helps. Okay. Um, now you have the mental body that happens. Then you go to the causal body, the the, the, the higher mental. You look at the uh, incarnate soul energy. It anchors down, and obviously, what is more subtle, the incarnate soul energy or the etheric body or the physical body? Just one second. Um, just a second. I'm just trying. Uh, so obviously, it'll interpenetrate everything. It'll go through the the mental body. It'll go through the emotional body. It'll go through the etheric body. It'll go through the physical body. It'll go through everything. That is why every cell of your body has soul energy. Okay. Now, some people say, uh, or in the Bible, it's written, uh, what comes out of your mouth is more important than what goes in. You know. So, what comes out of your mouth is supposed to dirty your soul. Now, how does it dirty your soul? When you think of something dirty, when you think of something uh, like angry or you insult someone, you generate the thought form. What generates the thought form? The emotional body. But you remember between the spaces in the emotional body and into every cell of your emotional body, there is soul energy. So what do you think will happen? So when you generate anger, the emotion of anger comes, what happens to the soul energy at that particular point? That is number one. Does it get dirty? Probably, right? So, so it dirties the soul, okay? Now, why are we talking about this? When your physical body dies, the process of withdrawal, right, with the three seeds, if you read the book, Achieving Oneness with a Higher Soul, it withdraws, and I think, if I remember correctly from the book, it says when the physical, uh, when the seed is unplugged, the physical body dies. Did not say anything about etheric, did not say about emotional, nothing, okay? So the physical body is dead, so the incarnated soul, which has interpenetrated all these vehicles, have, has now withdrawn from the, uh, from the physical body, and what is happening in this process of withdrawal, even according to, I think, Alice Bailey's books, is that uh, the principle of correspondence between the etheric and uh, uh, the physical body through the nervous system is being disentangled, right? So the soul is withdrawn out of the physical body, but it is still within the etheric body, <laughs> all right? And it is still within the, um, the, uh, the astral and the mental. And the problem is the astral is still also within the etheric and the mental is also still within the etheric. This etheric body needs to go away for them to be free, okay? Now what happens? You have lived for many years. You're used to your physical body. You have no idea. Supposing a person has no idea about the soul, for them, the body, the physical uh, life is everything. Physical matters, everything. Money is everything. The whole life they've tried to earn. So they're very materialistic. They're very uh, focused on the physical plane. So what happens is this incarnated soul, which is now withdrawn, it is also part of the astral mental. This incarnate soul, which is now inside the etheric body, starts to, because it has its will, instead of being attracted, there, there's a law of attraction going on. It's not avoiding the pull of the higher soul, of the higher uh, nature, but it is trying to force itself back into the physical body, this incarnated soul. So that is why for your etheric body to be free, for you to be free of you, you the soul, to be free of the etheric body, you need to withdraw out of the etheric body. So it says, as days pass, the higher principles gradually disengage themselves, disengage themselves from the double. And the latter then becomes into an etheric corpse. Now that is, if you know about the, now if you know about the principle of the soul, you're tuned into your higher nature, you want to go back, you know that you, you're not the body, no problem. You don't focus on the physical, you withdraw completely. The soul withdraws completely out of the etheric body and then the etheric shell remains, okay? Not the, just like your physical shell remains, your etheric shell remains. And since the etheric shell, you know, it's like sometimes when you put a, a mold for a long time, it leaves a mark, right? Or you put a, you know, a pressure. So since this 
uh, etheric body has been imprinted <laughs> literally on the physical body for 20, 30, 40, 50, 80 years. When it goes, it sort of looks like you, but it's not you, it's just a shell, okay? It's just a shell, all right? And as it disintegrates, like Sumi says, it will start to uh, have uh, you know, problems. Um, so that is, that is the whole idea. Now, the reason sometimes it, it hangs around is because it's used to the physical body. It's used to being correspond. It's like, you know, you're used to doing something for how many years and then suddenly, you know, you're not corresponding to that anymore. So you're hanging around there. Okay. That's why it's hanging around there. That happens usually, usually for uh, people who are more physically, um, you know, physically, you know, more materialistic, more, you know, attached to the physical plane, let's say. All right. That's why I explained to you, in some people, like one of my experiences, uh, we were observing and the etheric body was there only for a few seconds. I mean, the soul just withdraw out of it just after, it's just like you remove a, you know, your shirt. I mean, it was there and then after a few minutes, it was not there anymore. <laughs> what? You were discussing it with me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway. So she was also there. She also sensed it. And so did, uh, I think, um, Sriram. Anyway, so, um, so this, was, this was the whole idea behind the withdrawal of the, uh, the etheric body. So the idea is you have to, why are we talking about this? Yeah, so that's, that's the higher principle, all right? And the rates, and then what else? One of the greatest, so now, if you cremate the body, <laughs> right? The soul has to vacate because <laughs> based on the principle of, Correspondence is not fully complete yet. They cannot be attached to the physical. Uh, you see, there is the, you have to understand, it's very difficult to explain sometimes. There is the higher will, right? You have your, you, the incarnate soul, has your will. Your will, your love, everything is contaminated with existence on the physical plane, okay? Because you are being exposed to other people's will and you are being exposed to other people's uh, emotions and other people's, uh, uh, you know, uh, thoughts. So it's being influenced. So when your body dies, you are so attached to the, uh, the physical plane, you want to go back to your body. But if there's no body, then you have to look the other way. When, you have no, when, the, when the bridge is burnt in front of you, you have to look behind and see what else is there, right? So once the etheric body, once the soul is withdrawn out of the etheric body, just the shell remains, then that process of disintegration can take maybe just a few weeks. It's just like, because it's still made of prana, it's just like you never charge your phone again. So the natural process of discharge is happening. And that etheric matter is then recycled uh, in the inner world or whatever. It's not, not wasted because matter cannot be created or destroyed. It's just, it's just reused, all right? Maybe to create some other person's etheric body. It's secondhand recycled. <laughs> So, anyway. We are here for millions of years. Yeah, so we have a lot of, you know, it's not uh, eco-friendly to throw away so much etheric garbage, right? So it's just recycled, as far as I know. Okay, so that's why, uh, that's why it's uh, there. Now, in addition, there are certain unclean black magic. I don't want to talk about that. Um, the etheric body of a dead person may similarly be used in a variety of ways. All of these possibilities avoided by the wholesome practice of cremation. Uh, it's quite poss impossible for a dead person to feel... Okay, so that's there. Uh, you finished all this, right? In case of people who did... Da, 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 Awakened, surrounded by Ashram. Okay, I think that's it. What are you questioning? I don't know if I was trying to read. But... Yeah, but I was... In transplant, where we donate our organs, like kidneys, da, 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 is our soul predominantly there? I mean, our soul still lay... Uh, no, the soul is not there. The soul is already withdrawn out of the physical body. But sometimes there are certain imprints of that person's personality within the organ. Remember, I told you because it's been sorry, it's been interpreted by the mental energy, emotional energy, and etheric energy for all these years. So, like Sumi saying, the emotions and the thoughts are imprinted onto the organs. So one of the things I remember Master Cho uh, was telling us was that we were thinking at that point we're talking about twenty odd years. Uh, we thought you know we could donate our eyes, our organs. So he says, the problem is not your donation. Uh, the problem would be whether the energy of your organs would be compatible with the person you're donating it to. So whether their energy will be at the same frequency as yours. The vibrations, accept. yeah. And so that's, uh, so that's the reason he says, maybe it's not a good idea for you to think of donating your organs at this point. 
uh, because of the, those uh, those respective things. So if there will be energy from the person from whom you're receiving the organ. There will also be the emotional and the mental thing. And that's why you, you hear stories of who, people who had a heart transplant and then they have memories of the person uh, whose heart they've actually received. So it's just got to do with that uh, thought form or that emotion going into the aura of that person and then she or he can actually sense it and feel it. People are very dense, probably won't. <laughs> but they have bovine implants and all of that now. So you start moving and stuff also. So I don't know about the, the animals. The valves, uh, so animals. But, but I'm sure even if you do, it depends on the way that animal was tra- treated <laughs> and how gross that energy is. Retracted. There was a Malayalam movie about someone who got a heart implant. I think it was Mohanlal or Mamuti in the 90s. And then, uh, you know, he sees the ghost of that person. And then, you know, it's... So I it feels, think, uh, yeah, for, no, no, uh, murder. He was actually oh, it's murder. I, I, it's, it's nice as if when I watch it. I think it's copied from an English one also. Probably. <laughs> okay, so uh, coming back to that, so that's the transplant, and so uh, we we have to see to it that the energy is compatible, and that's why it is good for you to do healing before and after, but never do master healing because if you enhance the immune system, it will reject the implant or the new organ as an alien and so we'll try to see that it, it's chucked out so you have to be very careful never to do master healing yeah, uh, you, don't we, you, yeah you don't want to enhance the immune system of a person who's receiving an organ from, from a donor yeah and uh, what else um, look it's logic right you are in spirituality you want to awaken your kundalini so every cell of your body can handle more voltage that's the whole idea right so that the whole higher soul can come into your body so obviously uh, what your body can handle is it has to be vibrating at a much, much, much higher frequency. So when you just introduce that into someone else and say they're uh, not performing the proper dietary restriction, um, you know, they eat a lot of pork or they smoke a lot, then it can pro- probably have some side effects. Not experimented with it. The best way to know is to experiment. But uh, uh, when you talk about blood donation, uh, you got to remember usually blood donation is at the point of Uh, very critical between life and death. So if it means that we should actually give the blood, whether you're a happy kilo piece or a prani kilo or not, better to give than not to. Uh, When, if you're receiving, I remember uh, it was suggested that we actually know prani healers or happy kilo uh, if you're an happy kilo or a prani healer, respectively, someone of the same blood type, so they could probably give it to you, right? So at least the energy is... I think maybe you can take your own blood, right, and store it? Yeah, you can store your own blood and see that it's used... But what if it's like years old and you evolve so much (laughs) that you contaminate yourself with yourself? (laughs) (laughs) You give yourself Kundalini syndrome. Damn it, this blood is old. My own blood. It's dirty. I should just kept it last week. <laughs> and then you can't keep giving blood <laughs> every year and keep. I don't know how long you keep it. I don't know also. <laughs> anyway. But I remember he used to tell us you should keep your DNA and check your DNA after no, that is 10, 15 years of erratic practice. That there's actually usually a change. Anyway, so now let's go on. <laughs> yes, you get contaminated by yourself. Okay, so continue. Okay, so sorry for the freezing. There's been a little bit of unstability with, with my connection for some reason today. I've been having meetings from the morning. She overused it. <laughs> the beings are now tired of <laughs> maintaining the stable state. So as you know, if you, you, you're in a happy yogi, you saw us in the morning. I had a couple of hours of break and then from 12 all the way till now, I've been literally on, on this, doing meetings and finishing stuff. So sorry about that. Um, moving on. Almost the end. Uh, I think even my brain is kind of <laughs> overused today. So let's try and finish this off today for all of us. So in the process of this etheric shell, as it, uh, as it starts to wear out, yes, uh, in spite of its struggles, though usually not until after the person, that is the soul, has su- suffered intensely. Some people among the dead do try to help these people, but with very, very little success. So those who have gone beyond death and they can see this person struggling with his ethnic uh, double, like a shell or a, literally like a, like, a, like a prison within that, they also find it difficult to help them, even though they realize that they, this person should transcend from this shell, break out of it literally and move into the astral plane. Even the people there who are already dead and, and in the next phase of life, uh, they also can't help these people. Yes? So I think um, a lot of the prayers that you and I do for the dead, which, which is there in all religions, whether it's seven days, five days, 14 days, 30 days, whatever, one year, 
uh, it's all meant basically to send vibrations towards this person to be able to pass through what is the next phase, which is purification or purgatory, uh, so that it becomes easier. The transition becomes easier for them. Yes. So all your prayers are always welcome, please. Now, uh, I'm, I'm okay. Let me just end this and then yeah, we'll finish the whole chapter because I'm. Sometimes a person in this condition <laughs> may endeavor to get in touch once again with the physical plane through a medium. So a medium is basically a person who's already in the physical body. Yes, and they can allow the so-called um, beings who've left their physical body to use their body to try and release, uh, send out messages or, or, or do what, is, what was untold at this point. However, they say that uh, the medium itself has what is called the spirit guide. And the spirit guide of uh, a medium or any person does not give the so-called wandering uh, soul access to use the medium. However, if it is used, uh, they say, knowing that the medium runs the risk of being uh, obsessed or maddened, which means that it can affect them uh, both mentally and uh, psychologically or other psychologically. And therefore, it's not a very good option for anybody to try and become a medium to help people in between the physical realm and the uh, inner realm. Yes. And then it goes on to say that occasionally, an unconscious medium, normally a very sensitive young girl. Basically, we're talking about someone who's very vulnerable, emotionally vulnerable, uh, physically vulnerable, and even mentally vulnerable. And so what happens is their body is then used and uh, invariably the, the attempt of this wandering soul to use this girl's body only can happen if that incarnated soul is super, super uh, weak, right? In the sense that the vehicles are weak, everything is weak, and then this wandering soul can, can kind of uh, use the body. Now, sadly, uh, from, from the people I've spoken to in different uh, parts, they, if this does happen to them, when the so-called wandering soul moves, they, they feel very, very exhausted, physically, emotionally, mentally. They take time, they literally have to rest their bodies, uh, they feel very drained. And so they're very scared of even moving out because they feel if they go out somewhere out of their house, uh, they might be, uh, I, I don't know if you can call the word attacked, but, you know, possessed by another wandering soul. And that is quite scary for them because the process of someone else using your bodies, your vehicles is not easy. The contamination is one, but also your body cannot handle it. And so even with highly evolved beings, so for example, when you look at the life of the great healer and the great teacher, Lord Jesus, uh, for the Lord Christ to use the body of uh, even the Lord Jesus had to be purified to a high, high degree and then allow another higher, highly evolved being to use it even for, for some time is something that uh, they have to do uh, on, on a high degree of uh, both purification and, if, and, and also to evolve. So when it happens to simple people, you know, um, young girls, very weak people, uh, people who are sometimes even just sick or weak for some time and these beings possess them, it becomes very difficult for that soul post uh, the entire, uh, entire episode and, and the trauma of it after that is quite difficult for them. And so they need a lot more healing, right? Uh, so coming back, so it's usually uh, done with someone who's, whose body's vehicles are all uh, weak, now, the word here that says the girl's ego, it's not the ego. The ego is the highest soul. It's actually the incarnated soul or the Jeevatma. And where am I? Yes. And uh, by indulging... Girl's in yeah, ego, incarnated soul uh, has, uh, his whole, has weakened its hold over the vehicles. That means the spiritual cord is small, basically. Right. And uh, indulges in... And also the person indulges in unwholesome thoughts and uh, passions as well. So when you start doing certain things where the energy of your body starts to change, becomes weaker and weaker, that is another way in which this, uh, this uh, possession, if you want to call it, can occur. Occasionally, also a human soul, this is the wandering soul that I'm talking about, um, it might also seize an animal, right? So you see, they are so obsessed about their physical form. Since their physical bond either is disintegrated or is burnt or whatever, they need to come back. They need to find another victim. So the easiest victim is, yes, the first is would be a human who's very, very weak and they can possess. 
And if they can't find that, then they'll try and even try and possess an animal. Yes. So you can imagine how difficult it must be for them in that state. I mean, for us, it, it, it almost sounds cruel, but for them, they want to survive in the physical body. And so they go uh, across to try and find animals, possessing an animals. Uh, those most commonly seized upon are the ones that are less developed, right? So it can start from cattle, sheep, swine, to dogs and cats and monkeys as well. So any of these mediums uh, could sometimes be used, right? And so it ends by saying, this appears to be the modern, that is the fifth race. Substitute for the awful life of vampire found in the fourth race people. Once entangled with an animal, this is the most difficult. With a human, it's much easier. They say that uh, dis disentangling them is, uh, is a gradual, yes, uh, and you need to use considerable amount of effort to try and get them out. Uh, extending probably for many, many days, right? So when they kind of possess an animal, coming out of that animal is not that easy. You've got to remember that you've gone to a completely different kingdom, right? Just to, just to be able to feel something physical. And even then they don't get gratification because obviously what an animal wants and what you want is completely different. The animal, even if you stay in that house, is not going to get anything. And if it's a sheep or something, they'll be chucked out of the house. And then lastly, it says freedom usually comes only at the death of the animal. Can you imagine? And, and I mean, for example, a dog could last for 13 years. And if you've caught it at a very young age, you're going to be in that body for a while. Sometimes, hopefully, they're lucky they come out in a few days. And even then, there remains an astral entanglement to shake off. Yes? So you've got to remember that there are these people, uh, which, which was mentioned in, in the earlier book that we were talking about, where, for example, if they love to drink, right? And they, their need and their desire, they realize even if they have the etheric, you know, the double and they're going around it, even if they try to drink from a glass, they don't get that satisfaction. Because obviously you don't have the physical body, the physical organs, you don't have the palate, the taste, nothing. And so sometimes, I remember the book, it says, they actually go into a barrel of beer and try and sit in it to be able to enjoy. But the problem is the desire is so strong and the desire can never disappear because it's still there. Yes, wrapped and entangled in, in you. And so they, they struggle to, to get out and purify themselves out of this. And another is where this man has so much, you know, that he has, I don't know if you can call it, hoarded into his uh, treasure chest or his, uh, what you, you and I would call a locker, that after he dies, he tries to stay around that locker, you know, trying to hug it and see that nobody can use it. But family members come open it you know, take the money and go. And he's trying to stop them from taking it because it's his possession, but he can't do anything. And so they do suffer a lot when they get stuck with the physical life. Yeah. Okay, Amit. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, with the drinking, uh, it's more the astral because the etheric, you don't get the satisfaction you do with the astral. And anyway, this is not the astral body. Otherwise, there's been one or two cases where it was observed where, uh, you know, a person who is in the astral body wanted to had the desire to drink a lot so yeah. and then they got the satisfaction but that anyway that that's no sorry i was just connecting it to the desire for the physical so, life that now is so the question strong. is can we heal using psychotherapy after death since the astral body is there and the answer is no you cannot just remove uh, a lot of the shell the inner noises that you've accommodated for decades with just uh, psychotherapy and it's complicated i mean you you, you won't be able to do it as far as I know, unless you're a very developed teacher. So there are three ways. See, basically within the aura and the chakras, there are clouds of emotions, uh, clouds of thoughts, which you have been accumulating for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more. It's a lot of garbage, right? It's not only in the aura, but it's also in the chakras, all right? Another problem is with this is uh, not only if a person is alive, you see, uh, it's an issue. And we talk about how it's an issue when you're alive. This is death. So we talk about death. Uh, but when the body is dead, these thought forms, they form a hard shell, okay? Um, and it's like a big, big shield when Master Joe was talking about it. So it prevents you, it prevents the soul from withdrawing from it. Remember, the soul is interpenetrating the astral body. So it prevents the soul, it's like frozen. It prevents it from going back to the higher world. Okay, so now the thoughts you see right now when your body's dead, they undergo a sort of restructuring um, and it, has a, it basically has a consciousness of its own. Okay, the, they have a consciousness because they're entities, right? So they have a consciousness of their own. And it goes, um, 
and forms a, you know, it, it undergoes restructuring, forming a big shield outside the bodies. All right. Uh, so when the person dies, the person cannot go to the high world. So the person is stuck in the lower world. Okay. Uh, now, until which these shields, which made of thought forms and emotions, it starts to gradually disintegrate and this takes time. All right. Hence you have purgatory. Now, what are ways to avoid it? Number one, you can do twin hearts regularly. You can do meditation in the inner breath if you're an arhatic yogi regularly, which removes this uh, shell gradually. Okay. Uh, with mantras, it takes, it can happen, but it takes decades of work with inner breath, especially inner breath and twin hearts. Maybe in just a few years, it goes. The other thing you can do is in Christianity, you have baptism by water. Okay. So a person who's highly developed, according to Master Chua, uh, through spiritual development and with the help of the high beings, they're able to consecrate the water, okay? So that the people uh, who immerse their body into water, not only their body, but their aura and their chakras, okay? And also the entire soul gets substantially cleansed, all right? So uh, the shell is broken down. So when the person dies, they go straight to heaven, okay? That is why uh, I think in the book, in the teachings of Hinduism Revealed, the new edition, Master Chua recommends you do the... Um, the uh, you go to the Ganga and immerse yourself once a year or once every few years because you just keep it clean because you don't, you don't know when you're leaving. So if the shell is clean, then you're out of there. You know, it's quick. All right. But and he says three, to try and go to the upper part, yeah? More closer to the source rather than... Yeah, don't mention it. <laughs> so anyway, so... Um, <laughs> I thought you were going to mention the place. So the astral body, the, the astral body basically... When you're in the astral body, you have freedom of movement all over the place. So many of the ghosts you see in your dreams and all, they could be most likely in their astral body. Like one time there was this teacher, I won't say the name. Um, you know, um, they were, he was walking in a resort with one of his students, right? And in the resort, they saw a ghost waiting in front of the bus. <laughs> all right. Look, it's nothing great. If you can see emotional energy, you can probably see that. All right. So one of the, so one of them communicated with the ghost and said, okay, what are you doing in front of this bus line? So the ghost said, oh, I want to go back to my hometown, but I don't have the money for the bus, right? Um, honest ghost, <laughs> okay? So uh, what the teacher did was explain, look, your body, number one, is already dead, <laughs> right? That is number one. Number two, you, the soul, are functioning in another body, the body made of light, all right, which has no physical restrictions. Now, you don't need a bus to go from one place to another. All you need to do is concentrate on your hometown, you'll be there. Okay, so the ghost exactly did what she was told and disappeared. I don't know where it went, but must have gone home. Yeah, so so that's why in the inner teachings they say to die is to be really born, and to be born is so to be born basically is to be born in the inner world. All right. Anyway, this is not to do with etheric, so we'll skip this topic. You who said the other day that death is basically the movement of consciousness. Yeah, one body. it's just movement of consciousness. Of course, you still yeah. miss the person and everything. Yeah, but. Uh, you see, one of Master's very close friends, very, very close friend, um, he died. And he was a very big, stout guy, okay? He, he, people thought he was paralytic. He was not really paralytic. Master Cho just said he's oversized, so he can't move really well, okay? Uh, and he couldn't really move his body. He was he's a good soul. According to Master Cho, a beautiful soul. All right, so when he died, Master said he was, he, Master Cho said he was really, really very happy because, you know, he was just jumping from one place to another. It's, and he was moving all over the place. I know it sounds weird, right? But we're talking about, but the question was there. So, so, you know, dancing, doing all these things that they couldn't do physically, right? So because there was- they were bound to the body which couldn't help them. Yeah, anymore. so there was tremendous freedom when the person dies. Sometimes it's like being out of a cage. That's why many people talk about it being a prison. And I think in one of Alice Bailey's books, she talks about how actually to die is you're going back to your higher soul. You're going back in the inner world where your teacher, everything is there. But to be born is actually the most loneliest because you're in a new body. You're with a new, you're with a new group of souls that you have to learn with. So it's, it's a very different way of looking at it. So for, so according to uh, Holy Master Dual Kultur, Alice Billy, he said that the, the, to be born is actually the most painful, loneliest time. Not to die. To die is just being free. Right? So anyway. Um, and there are people who talk about the spirits and all these things. Look, you have to be very careful because there are things in the astral body, but you have to be very careful. Your body is like a sophisticated computer. All right. Um, it has programs and it has consciousness of its own. Okay. Uh, sometimes you remember the soul is withdrawn from the etheric. Once everything is clean, the soul also withdraws from the astral body. 
all right it withdraws and once it withdraws from the astral body the astral body starts to disintegrate but so the but when the soul just leaves the astral body for some time the astral body is just a shell it's just a shell uh, like a vacated home all right but the astral body has a consciousness of its own <laughs> it's made of energy energy which has a consciousness of its own it has memory right it has still that it's not been rebooted yet so it still has memory okay so if you're not careful you think you're talking to a soul all right but actually you're actually talking to what you're talking to is just a cell a shell it's soulless okay um but it still has the ability to mimic you <laughs> Okay, yeah. so even though you're not in there anymore, it has the ability to mimic you. Okay, anyway, fine. Now the question is, all this stuff is there. By the way, this is the foundation about this cow and swine and monkey. This is the foundation of uh, in in Hindu culture. They like uh, you'll be born as a animal. You are you were born in in your previous life. You were a donkey. You were a dog. You know, uh, before I used to like to sniff my food a lot, so my dad would be like. Uh, I think you were a dog in your last lifetime. <laughs> so, so we asked Master Chua, can I really reincarnate an animal? He's like, no. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, is it possible to reincarnate as a cockroach? <laughs> so the answer is no. Uh, is, it, uh, is it possible? What Master Chua said was, is it possible for the chicken to become an egg again? <laughs> okay. So the answer is no, no, no. All right. You must understand that you have evolved to a certain level. Okay, uh, a certain level that of a human being. All right, for you to backtrack for an animal is almost impossible. All right, it, it, it's almost impossible. I think you should remove this from your system. All right, so there are stories of human beings reincarnating as an animal. If you read some stories, according to Master Choa, these stories are not actually true, uh, they're just um, it's a man, according to him, it's a manifestation of ignorance. Okay, um, people, a lot of people, they have fear of death. Okay, this is what I understood from Master Cho explaining. And um, you see, they think death is the end. That's it, there's nothing else, right? So when their body dies, they move to another body, which is called the Kamakosha or the emotional body. And they immediately, according to Master Cho, start to look for whatever is available. Okay, whatever is available. So they see a pig, they jump into a pig. Uh, they see a dog, they jump into a dog. They don't reincarnate as a dog. They don't reincarnate as a pig. They just possess the dog uh, or the pig. Is that okay? Um, they possess, they don't reincarnate. That's possession, just like the book explains, all right? Uh, and that's possession because it's, and it has to do with obsession, obsession with physical plane, all right? So, um, you see, um, So forget just about reincarnating as a cow or anything like that. It's impossible unless you're, according to Master Joe, unless your karma is really, 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 really super bad. <laughs> I don't know what he meant by that. <laughs> okay, what is super bad? Even if the karma is super bad, he said it's almost impossible. All right. So, um, so that's that. So now how does it possess the animal? I didn't bother asking because I didn't, I wasn't so interested in the whole thing. So anyway, that's that. The topic has finished. So more importantly, you need to keep your etheric body clean. You need to understand you're the soul. When your body dies, you need to be able to detach from the etheric body. You need to keep your astral and mental body clean. Make sure you're doing at least a meditation twin hearts, some type of meditation or immersion or something to make sure you have minimal, uh, you know, shell, um, you know, thickness. And so when your body dies, you can go faster. And of course, focus on the light as explained in the, uh, achieving uh, oneness with the highest soul. And I completely forgot to show the PowerPoint, so I'll show it very, very quickly, super fast. This is one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so this is the flashback. I think we covered this, all right? This is from the achieving oneness with the highest soul. And according to Master Choa, uh, this works because the brain almost is physically dead, but the higher energy sun, so the etheric body is still alive. So here's another hint, okay? Now, the body can be cremated after 12 hours to facilitate the transition. So he's explained the same thing, and that's that. <laughs> All right. What? So uh, when, when and if you, in your dreams or in your meditations, start to foresee uh, that something would happen to someone, right? It could be an accident. It could be something else. 
Now, uh, can you actually, uh, can your good karma actually change that? Yes. Remember, the future is dynamic. What is yet to happen can always change. Yes, from the story that he mentioned about the uh, person uh, who was predicted that he would die, things can change because in that due time between that event and today, if you do something, things can change. So that way, yes, if you have generated good karma, that uh, accident might be delayed. So for example, I remember Master Cho was mentioning that uh, there was this person who was uh, informed that he would die. And uh, he obviously did certain good things. I won't go into the story right now because we don't have time. And in the end, uh, he just gets cut, right? And he says, nothing really happened to me. I just got a cut on my hand. He says, you know, you were actually supposed to be stabbed to death. But because of the good that you did, the extension of that karma only manifested as a scar on your hand right now. That's it, right? Of course. So which means that the, the I call it the expiry date. <laughs> your expiry date. I call then, it discount. <laughs> was then insane, yes, postponed to another date. Yeah. So that is one. Uh, then when you see a snake in your meditation, it's with reference to the Kundalini awakened. Mm -hmm. The fact that and, it's coiled. <laughs> requires more meditation. Correct. And if it's come only to the forehead, which is maybe one of the sub layers, which has reached maybe the, the uh, point of the forehead chakra. But how did a coil is, snake move on your forehead? Like that? Like uh, it has to uncoil to move, right? Maybe it's uncoiling on a forehead. I'm not sure. Anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Fine. Uh, so not to get Probably worried, it's the chakra. <laughs> yeah, not to get worried about that, uh, though it does feel a little frightening at that point. Yeah, I think it's just your uh, forehead. It's just the chakra moving in a way, and your 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 body is symbolizing it as a coiled snake. I, it, it for me, I, I I think it's the chakra. I think so. Okay, and the other who uh, Sonia, you said you felt pressure and it felt like ants all over your head. It could be also the energy which feels like tingling or something like running all through the brain or the head region. Was it uh, prickly or was it uh, tingly? Yeah, so that's that's very important. If it's that. tingly, it's energy moving coming into your body. If it's prickly, it's energy coming out of your body. Both are good, so don't worry about it. <laughs> all right. Yes, Will Smith in Gemini Man. Yes, that's with reference to your joke earlier. Anyway. Can we use uh, I don't know. I'll tell you later once uh, I leave the body. So now, After who's dead? You're dead? I don't know. You can try. I would prefer to do it before. You should you know, know you're the soul, so you just leave. He's reading the chat of uh, the third last person, I think, there, or the fourth last. That was the next one, right? Because yeah, you're because you're not uh, mentioning what it is. You're just Balichandra, saying, sorry. I thought they are just answering, so they may not know what it all Does this unsigned stabilize and help improve transition? Yes, uh, like yes. we said, it's just shift of consciousness. What we're talking is affecting your astral and uh, mental body. So, yes, and all this theoretically with speaking, you. everything. Yeah, you are you. So you, the soul, actually have all this data. So even when you leave and you go back all the way home to your causal uh, body and uh, reunite with your higher soul or your Atma, when you come back next lifetime, this is actually there. So that's why sometimes, even if you haven't read the books and people start talking about it, you're like, oh my God, this sounds so familiar, right? Uh, it might also be something that you have uh, heard of before and you're relearning it at this point. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, yeah, something about science therapy. You can try. I've not tried. Does this... Uh, and uh, how do we keep the astral body clean? We all explained that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not easy because you have to keep it clean by meditating twin hearts and the inner breath. Triple so, lock. Yes, there is a triple lock that in the meditations of Grandmaster, we don't actually use that system. I talk about the three bandhas. Is, the, root, the, the root lock, the throat lock, okay. and this one. It's, uh, it's a form of moving the Kundalini. Correct. So we don't use that. Uh, it's the Hatha Yoga version. Right. So we use a different form of movement of energy instead of using the locks. Yeah, because this, this one, it's a little bit slower. And more importantly, it doesn't remove uh, the inner noises. You see, a lot of garbage gets cleaned out. A lot of seeds get cleaned out with the cleansing circularization. With the three lock method, it's just awakening the Kundalini and moving it up. It does not remove the inner noise. It is your chip. Your chip is basically your physical permanent seed. So it has all the data with it. And so does your soul energy. Okay, let's so end. Want to add, uh, what is it? While meditating, the whole body is engulfed in flames. It's not hot. It's just divine energy coming down.
Yeah, looking like a golden aura, but but maybe like a flame. Sometimes it's cool, and sometimes it's tickling. You know, like sometimes it can be hot. Yeah. All right. So that's it, uh, people. We finish with the chapter. We'll see you on Friday. Yeah. Next chapter healing. Yes, healing. The chapter is healing. So I'll let's just stream. end with the prayer. Close your eyes. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chua Kok Su, Lord Mahai Guru Jameel, to all the great ones, to all the Holy Masters, Holy Gurus, to all the healing ministers, the beings of knowledge, light and power, the angels and beings of communication on our respective Wi-Fi's, to our soul and divine self. We thank you all for your great, great blessings, for all your light, your knowledge and wisdom, for clarity and tremendous patience. We ask you to continue to help us to absorb and assimilate this and use it to become better instruments in your service. So thanks and in full faith, Sadhguru. Thank you, everybody. Atma Namaste. Bye. We'll see you at, in the end of July. <laughs> Friday is the last day for July, sir. Really? Thank you so much. Atma Namaste. Bye. I just uh, went from you. Yep. Okay, ending it for all. See you on Friday. Bye bye.